All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to a new academic year of history at our house. You all know me, I think, at this point, but let me go ahead and introduce myself. I am Mr. Powell. I am the creator and teacher of History at Our House, and this year we are going to study European history together. The History at Our House program operates on a rotation of classes, so one year we'll study ancient, which we did last year, and then the year after we study European, and then finally in the three-year program rotation we study American history. That's coming up next year. So we're going to do Europe today and, of course, for the remainder of the year. And we're going to start with the question that we need to have a good answer uh, for ourselves, to, we, that we need to have for ourselves, um, and that is, why do this? Why study European history? Because we don't live in Europe, so the answer is non-obvious in that particular regard. It could make sense to most people to study the history of the place where they live, uh, and so, but, but not so much, let's say, another part of the world. So that's going to be our first order of the day, is to figure out why are we going to study this particular story, European history. Uh, why is it so important to study it this year? Now, the first thing that I want to say about all of this and the proceedings here at History at Our House is that I have uh, returning veterans here of the program and I have new students with us uh, that have joined us uh, mostly through their prior attendance in the Big Picture History series. And I'm really glad to have you join me now because I think that's a great sign that if you enjoyed those lectures or found that you were learning history in a new way through the Big Picture History series, then you're really going to appreciate the opportunity to study it long term with History at Our House. Because the key to what we did in Big Picture History and the key to what we're going to be doing in this year is that we are not just going to study the past. That is the trap that people have, so many people have fallen into. And as a result, they do not feel that history matters. So what happens is if you feel like you're studying, you're just studying the past in history, then you feel like, well, I don't live in the past, right? You feel, I'm, I live in the present. I've got to make my th way through life here and now. And so I'm going to figure out what skills I need to get a job and, and that sort of thing. And that becomes your focus. And that's how most people have responded to the conventional or the normal way of studying history. Luckily, history at our house is not the normal way. We are going to look at the past in a different way. That is, we are going to focus on a subject that connects the past to the present, a subject that helps us to be aware of, more aware of the world that we're actually in as we experience it. The things that we are learning about as we grow, you all are going through your education, you're starting to collect together the knowledge and the skills that you need in order to operate in this life as an independent human being. And you're going to emerge out there in the world, you're going to go and rent that first apartment, you're going to go and have your first car and you're going to go to college and whatever other things that, that happen in your life, right? You're going to be navigating through this world here now in the present uh, and that's going to be fantastic for you. you got to get equipped uh, to understand this world that you're, navigate, that you're going to be navigating through because it's, it's a wonder. It's a wonderful world that we're in. Uh, and so it, you don't want to get stuck like too many people are stuck today with a kind of superficial understanding of it. Just seeing kind of what's in front of you in your neighborhood or in your hometown or just kind of what's around you and what everybody else sees. That superficial awareness is no, it's not enough for us as human beings. We need the power to see beyond what's in front of us. And history gives us that. It gives us what I, the power of insight. It's the primary value that we're going to be seeking today is insight into the world. A, a new kind of appreciation 
for the world that we're in to see things that most people can't see. And then something cool happens when you have insight and you also gain the ability to start to anticipate and to project the future. That's called foresight. And that is really cool too. The world as it comes at you does not, you don't experience it as just a bunch of stuff that's, that's random and hard to explain, but you actually start to understand it and you get to feel like how the world is moving. And you, you, you know that and you can anticipate it. And then you can act in a different way than other people if you understand the world that way. My favorite example of somebody that had these powers, insight and foresight and then the power to act in the world is right there for you thomas jefferson in all of the men of that generation known as the founding fathers they understood the power of history thomas jefferson said that history is that knowledge most useful to us as i like to call it today the mvs the most valuable subject People don't feel that way anymore because they're trapped in a way of thinking about the past, a way of thinking about history that says it's just the study of the past. We're not going to do that. We're going to look at the world that we live in. And we're going to focus really a lot in, at the initial stages of our study here. We're going to study on the, we're going to look at the present. I want you to get more about this world than your 10 probably as a, as a kind of general thing, as children especially, right, where you're still kind of growing and trying to understand. You probably haven't in, engaged with the world all that much yet in the way that I want to encourage you to do. So let's get into it here and let's talk about Europe's place in this world of ours because it's not obvious that we would study Europe, right? Let's get into that because, okay, the main idea is that I want you to understand is we're going to study the world around us, not just the past that's disconnected from us, one that's connected to us. But the question that should arise in your mind is, well, what is, what about Europe? Why would we bother with that? Where is, how does that fit in our world? Well, the first thing that I want to stress about the world that we live in that is amazing, okay? And I want to encourage you to be thinking in these terms as we go through the year, is that we now, just like the past is not disconnected from the present or different parts of the world are, are not apart from each other, uh, the world that we live in is all connected up in so many wonderful and complex ways. The best vocabulary word that I know of to uh, express this point is the word interconnected. Isn't this a cool map? Do you guys know what this is a map of? You can tell that it's a map, right? Anybody know what it is of? It's so neat. We have America here. What do you think this is a map of? Got Europe over here, right? Oliver, what's your guess? I think that it, it shows all the continents in the world. It certainly does, but the key is how does it do it? You see, it's got these little white lines that connect, that show a, each white line on this map, or a blue line if it's not as strong, is a connection. What kind of connection? Anybody know? That's why I love this map. See, you can see the Hawaii over here and the connections, and then all of the intense connections between the parts of America and so on. Opal, what do you think? How much that place is involved with the rest of the world and does with other places? Yes, but in one particular regard on this map. This is called, this is a map of Facebook. So you guys know what that is? You might not be on there yet, which is fine because it's more kind of in a grown up sort of a place, right? But it's a networking place. This is where adults go and tell what's going on in their lives and share pictures of their families and stuff like that. So every little line on this map is a, is a connection between one person and another person in the world. And when you map all those connections and the light gets really, the, the more connections there are, the brighter the light. So what do you get? Just like Oliver said, you see, the, you see the shape of the world. It's amazing. We're all connected to each other. But notice especially the connections between continents and other places in the world. Patrick, go ahead. 
the the white means it's the most it's the most connected. The most blue connected means, le means least means least connected. least connected. The darker it is, the less connected that it is on Facebook anyway. One interesting thing is, for instance, there's parts of Asia, especially China, that are not connected to us in this particular way. We're not going to be studying China closely today. Uh, I do have some things to say about China today in connection with Europe, but it's a fascinating kind of look at the world. Let's talk about the ways that we are connected beyond communication, because this is a, like an internet con connection map. What are other ways that we are connected to people in other parts of the world, other than the internet and the phone and things like that? Can you think of a way in which you are personally connected to the to other parts of the world. Who has some examples of that? Oliver, go ahead. Like they can be your cousins, they can be your brothers. That's a good that's brother. a great example, right? Family connections. Exactly. So I have family in places like Brazil, Israel, Canada, England. Yeah, exactly. And so every one of us has a network like that. It's a family network. Perfect. Good example. Can you guys think of another form of connection that we have to other parts of the world? I know that, Rosetta, you do this quite often. You are right now probably in America, but you have another connection to Europe especially, on a pretty regular basis. What's another kind of connection, Rosetta? Well, you can have friends in England. Well, okay, friendship is a connection. I was thinking more about you personally and how you live. You don't just live in America. You spend quite a bit of time in... England. Yeah, right. So you travel there, right? Travel is another form of connection. And then we have so many more. Patrick, will you go in my room and get me the, the cup? off my desk. It's a, it's a um, coffee mug, right? And bring it to me and then close the door because I want to show you guys a connection. What's another one, Sigourney? When you buy things in other parts of the world. Ah, commerce, trade, absolutely, right? We are very connected to each other in that particular way. I want to show you guys a great example of, in, oh, I, I need the other one. It's the, um, Yes, please. I, 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 I wasn't ready. I, I wanted to be ready with a certain cup. Is there another one in there? Can what? you bring it to me? There's a cup that I want to show you guys. It's my favorite example of interconnection. All right, I got my family scrambling to show you the cup. <laughs> they found it. Patrick, come cup. back. Okay, here's a great example of interconnection. This is my one of my favorite coffee mugs. And look what it says, right? What is it about? It's about the place where the Olympics just were, right? I wish I was still there watching the Olympics, but back in the States, so I'm not there now. But look what it is. It's a Rio de Janeiro cup. So that's like Brazil, right? And then notice, what is the brand of the cup? Where did I get this coffee mug, and what kind of coffee was I drinking? In Brazil, right, Opal? From Starbucks. Starbucks, which is an American company. Okay, but look, what does it say on the bottom of my Starbucks mug? Where was it made? It's kind of fuzzy, I bet. I guess the camera won't focus. Sigourney? Made in China. Made in China. Okay, wait. A Rio de Janeiro mug of an American coffee company that was made in China. <laughs> right? This is what this cup. This cup I'm holding in my hand is called interconnection, right there in your face, <laughs> interconnection mug. What does it mean? It means we are complexly and multiply connected to each other, not just little connections, not one or two or three, but so many. So that's why we have to study the rest of the world, and that's one reason why we have to study China, because made in China is just a revolution on modern life. And so in big picture history, I teach people about that. But the question that may come to mind, Patrick, go ahead. And that, another interconnection that I just that I just thought of is that is that a lot of the, is that a lot of the th things I have 
were made in China but were sold in American stores. Well, that's right. That's a version of the commerce we're talking about. Yeah, you go to Walmart, which is an American store, and then but the, it was so all the products are from somewhere else. It's really amazing. Or you go to the grocery store. My favorite butter comes from Ireland, and my favorite coconut water comes from Thailand. So my my grocery store gives me these things from around the world. It's phenomenal, and so that's part of this miracle of modern life. It's phenomenal. So it's more than just America that we need to know about, right? Because we're so connected to each other. But the question is, what about Europe? That's what we're really interested in now, right? What about Europe? What is, if you will, made in Europe? What about our world? If we're, we're here to study the world we live in, not the past. Europe's got lots of past. But what about the present? What, what matters about Europe today? Well, I love to use this map. Uh, in order to spur your thinking about Europe's influence in our world. And this map shows us the world from a certain perspective. And what do you think it is? What is the theme of this map that is not revealed to you because I didn't label it? It's a little bit of a mystery. What do you think this map tells you? There's only four colors on it other than gray. What do the colors represent? Patrick, go ahead. Well, there's red, there's blue, there's green, there's orange, and there's also okay. a little purple. No, it's blue and red to get together. So, oh. what are the colors? Henry, Wyatt? Uh, it is a map of the world languages from Europe. Excellent. Not just, it's, it's, it's a very specific map. It's a map of the, the world in which official languages are European languages. And including the parts of Europe itself, right, where it's dark gray on here, you can see that around the world, people use European languages in their governments. Of course, America, English, and Canada, English, and also French. That's why there's some blue there. The, the blue and red kind of mixed together. Opal, question or comment? Is Portuguese European? Oh, Portugal is in Europe. You bet. There it is. Spain and Portugal make up the peninsula called Iberia. So the Portuguese language that they speak in Brazil is an accent of a European language. Oliver? Portugal is European. One reason is because Portugal played in the Euro 2016. Well, that's a, that's, that would be a, a reflection of the fact. And yes, they won, didn't they? They won the soccer tournament this year. <laughs> that's right, Oliver. No, good observation. All right, so how come we have all these European languages around the world? They're not just in Europe. Why is the world like this? Well, Europe has played an crucially important role in shaping our world. We're gonna learn about that in part today. We're gonna to focus on Europe, not so much on its impact on the world this year, but it's really crucial to know about that. And so what did the Europeans do? The Europeans enacted something that's called the Age of Discovery. It is a spectacular period in history that of course includes the discovery of America with Christopher Columbus in 1492. He was European, of course. And other explorers all fanning out from Europe and going out on these voyages of exploration out into the world. The first man to circumnavigate the world, Ferdinand Magellan and his lieutenant Sebastian del Cano and others. Right? They explored the world and wove it together into this fabric that we have today. They didn't always do nice things. I mean, one of the things that the Europeans did was that they established empires. They conquered more primitive peoples. They colonized different parts of the world. This is a map of the British Empire about 100 years ago. So yeah, they did a lot of different things. Some of them good, some of them bad. Uh, most of them good and some of them bad. Oliver, go ahead. It would be a bit cool for me to be in the British Empire. You would like that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I agree. I mean, or perhaps in the former British Empire, right? So if you get a chance to study Canadian history and one lesson with me through big picture history or to go, yeah, I agree with you. There's, there's so many fascinating outcomes 
to the history of the British Empire, it's pretty cool. And, and the modern world was shaped by, by Britain, perhaps more than any country in the world, uh, including, of course, the 13 colonies became America, but, uh, but they started out as part of the British Empire. Okay, Oliver, something else? The reason... Oh, oh, I forgot my question. <laughs> okay, that's all right, no problem. So, yeah, so this is really crucially important that the Europeans spread their culture out into the world. And these language, this language map, just gives us just a little hint as to how important Europe has been to our world because language is just a vehicle. For what? What do we use language for, right? Language is just symbols. Some of them are spoken and some of them are written. What's it for? Right? It's, it's nice to know that people speak European languages, but what do we use language for to communicate what? Sigourney, go ahead. To communicate. Yeah, to communicate what? What's the content of our communications? Ideas. Ideas, yeah, absolutely. What else do we communicate? What other categories of things that go along with ideas? Our values. Patrick? What happened? Well, okay, yeah, that's our identifications of the world, knowledge that we have, right? Ideas takes the form of knowledge as well. Good. Commun ideas, knowledge, values, beliefs, all of the sum of our experience, we, we use language to communicate, right? So this is so crucial because Europeans have spread their languages out into the world, but along with that comes the content. Leo, what's on your mind? Um, you can spread your postings. Your, your, your what? With languages, you can brag all over the world. Well, yeah, that's true. You can. <laughs> you can do lots of things, absolutely. And if you've got a big empire, you might like to brag about it. <laughs> that can happen, true enough. What we're going to focus on here today as a jumping-off point for tomorrow and our study of Europe today. We're going to anchor our study of European history in Europe today. We're, I, what I want to identify for you is the following that Europe matters so deeply to the world because all of the important modern forms of government that exist in the world were invented by Europeans. All of them, without exception. Let me show you what I mean. Every single important form of government created in modern times is a European idea. Some of you from last year might remember what this one is or from American history. One of them is called constitutional monarchy. Anybody remember what that one's all about? Monarchy is the rule of one, right? But the constitutional part says what? Very important European idea. Henry, Wyatt? Uh, it means that there is also some city moves that even the monarch, the king, cannot violate. Absolutely, right? And that starts with, who remembers their anchor facts of European history? Starts where in European history? I mean, we're going to study it this year, but I'm wondering, well, can anybody remember from American history when the English lords imposed a great charter on somebody named John, a big troublemaker? Was that a? 1215. The? The Magna Carta. Awesome. All right, you're way ahead of the game. We're going to see that this year, this super important thing called the Magna Carta. Right? And based on that tradition, Patrick? When, when you said 215, I knew it was the Magna Carta. 1215. Yes, yeah, exactly. 12 okay. And based on that tradition, what did the founding fathers of the United States create? They were colonists from Europe. They had European ideas. They created the Republic of the United States. That's a great modern concept. And then we have other ones, some good, not so good. The worst one is probably communism. That has been tried and has mostly been given up on around the world. These are the flags of kind of the more famous communist countries around the world. One was the Soviet Union, which no longer exists. China, which tried communism, has mostly given up on it. And two really... Cuba and North Korea are countries around the world that are still kind of fiddling with it, but that won't last. It's just a terrible form of government. But it's a European idea. 
And that's where they got it from. And the key that we're going to be studying this year is that the Europeans are responsible for the most important ideas that people accept around the world today, namely democracy and dem democratic socialism. Who remembers from last year? Who invented democracy and when? Anchor fact review pop quiz. Who invented democracy? <laughs> I didn't give you any, any warning at all. Henry Wyatt? In 508 BC. Nice. Well done. Athenian democracy, 508 BC. Okay, and that's a part of Europe. It was an ancient part. And then later on, as we're going to learn this year, the French and other Europeans adapted that idea and created a modern idea that's called socialism. We're going to learn about that. It's called democratic socialism. But tomorrow comes a big word, a big concept, and hugely important because it's new and it's very important in our world today. Check it out. Supranationalism. That's a big one. And that is what Europe is today. And if you haven't done big picture history with me yet, you might not be too familiar with that one. But I guarantee you tomorrow you will learn what it is and you will learn why it matters so much. Because Europe is really working hard on this new idea. All these forms of government come out of Europe. The Europeans have been this culture in the world that generates these ideas of government and keep experimenting with them and some work and some don't and they throw them out and they try new ones and, and now they're trying yet another one, supranationalism, and it's going to be a big deal for us throughout our lives. I guarantee you this concept will be one you need to know in order to understand the world you live in. That's what we're here for, right? So that's what we're going to get to tomorrow, the idea of supranationalism. All right, guys. Hey, that was a good start. So thank you very much. And uh, so that is kind of a, the intro to the question why Europe matters. The impact of Europe on our world is just almost immeasurably large. It, it features in the language and in the ideas and beliefs and values spread throughout the world, this interconnected world that we live in. And now the Europeans have invented a whole new kind of government, and we're going to have to figure out what that is in order to be able to navigate through the world we live in. Okay, guys, thank you very much. Day one, we did it. Went well. Thank you. And I'll see you tomorrow. Bye for now. Bye. Thank you, Mr. Powell. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.